So in our last unit videos, we talked about DNA and the structure of DNA and how DNA is replicated. And in this unit, we're going to get into what specifically that DNA is used for and how it's used actually to make proteins. Uh, in previous units, we've talked about proteins and what they do and some of their different structures and functions in other videos. And so now we're going to learn exactly how that process works. And this is IB section 2.7 and 7.2 for the exam starting in 2016. And the first step to making a protein um, is the process called transcription. Transcription and translation are the two parts that make up protein synthesis or the steps to making a protein. And so in this video, we're going to look at transcription specifically. Transcription takes place within the nucleus. This is the nucleus here. And the DNA never leaves the nucleus because it's very easily, it can be very easily mutated and um, it needs to be protected. And so it stays inside of the nucleus. And during the process of transcription, a copy, if you will, of that DNA is made. And that is in the form of RNA, specifically mRNA or messenger RNA. And so transcription is the process of making that messenger RNA. Translation is the process of using that messenger RNA to make a protein. And we'll look at that in our next video. To review, let's look at the DNA structure uh, compared to the RNA structure. Uh, one of the things that's different between the two is sugar and DNA is deoxyribose and RNA is ribose. Uh, DNA contains guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine nitrogen bases. Uh, RNA contains the same except uracil replaces thymine. They both contain a phosphate group, and the shape of DNA is a double helix. It's two strands, whereas RNA is generally a single strand, um, and the shape of that can change a little bit. Messenger RNA is a single long ribbon. tRNA kind of has a clover leaf shape, and rRNA is found in ribosomes, actually. So the sequence, a polypeptide sequence, is the sequence of amino acids in a protein. And so this is copied from a, from a, a strand or a part of DNA um, and more specifically, a particular gene. And so during the process of protein synthesis and, and starting with transcription, a gene or section of the DNA is used to make that protein. And only certain genes actually get transcribed. Not all of the genes in DNA are going to be transcribed. And additionally, there's a lot of DNA that's not really used uh, to make proteins or for anything. So it's kind of space holders. And for a long time, scientists thought that there wasn't really any use of this DNA. It was kind of junk or garbage DNA. But new research is suggesting that maybe that's not the case and maybe the DNA does play a role in actually the genes that are used and the proteins that are transcribed. Uh, we're not exactly sure. And that's definitely one area of future research that if you're interested in biology that you could get into and try to help answer those types of questions. So the sequence of DNA helps to determine the messenger RNA which then goes on to determine the sequence of connected amino acids. Um, so the, the DNA is what's making or is used to make the messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA is kind of giving those instructions then to the ribosome and saying specifically what amino acids go in what order. And so to kind of visualize that, the DNA leads to messenger RNA, which leads to amino acids, which then leads to a protein by putting those amino acids together for a protein. So we've previously talked about nucleosomes, but again, uh, I want to recap what their purpose is and what they do. And within nucleosomes are uh, histone proteins, and they're associated with the eukaryotic DNA. And what they do is to help spool the DNA into chromatin. And that chromatin then condenses down actually to form a chromosome. So they're kind of helping to stabilize the chromosome. Um, they can also help to regulate the expression of, um, of the genes. Um, and, and modification of a histone protein can help to determine whether that gene actually will be expressed or not. Um, so the actual manipulation of that histone protein can, can influence the expression of the gene. Um, and that would include chemical modification, can sometimes either activate or deactivate genes by decreasing or increasing uh, the accessibility of the gene to transcription factors. So this protein that is associated on or around the DNA and helps to stabilize it in the chromosome can actually help to influence whether or not transcription will occur. So let's take a closer look at transcription here. Again, this is the process of making a copy of one part of the DNA. Of the, uh, DNA. Um, and it is carried out in a five prime to three prime direction. And in eukaryotes, this process um, is actually modified a little bit after the messenger RNA has been made. In eukaryotes, a small part of that uh, messenger RNA is actually removed to form mature RNA. And so this is where introns and exons come into play 
um, the introns are actually removed from the messenger RNA. And so then we're left with just a single strand of messenger RNA that contains just exons. Those introns are removed. Um, and, and this actually occurs, um, the introns are removed by something called SNRPs. Um, we're not going to get too closely into this. Um, it's uh, a little bit more explanation in your textbook or you can find online, but it's um, a process in which those introns are removed. Um, and so this forms mature messenger RNA. And here's a picture of that process happening. Uh, those SNRPs help to remove the intron, and so we're left with just the mature messenger RNA. Now, transcription is involved or de is somewhat dependent on something called a codon. And a codon is three nucleotides um, or three nitrogen bases in a row. And, that, and, and those three make up a codon. And what this does is it codes for, provides instructions to call for one amino acid. And we're going to see how this comes into play when we get into the process of translation. But a codon is three um, nucleotides or three nitrogen bases, and it calls for, codes for one amino acid. And so then what happens when those multiple amino acids are put together eventually in translation is that then goes on to make a protein. Now before transcription can begin, we need to identify the difference between the sense strand and the antisense strand. DNA obviously contains two, uh, two strands. Uh, to double helix. There's names for those different strands. One of them is the sense strand and the other is the antisense strand. In the process of transcription, the making of messenger RNA, only one of those strands are used and that is the antisense strand. Uh, that is used to make messenger RNA. So to kind of help illustrate that and break that down, the sense strand um, is not used to create messenger RNA. The antisense strand is used to create messenger RNA. The sense strand has the exact same uh, base sequence as messenger RNA, except that thymine is replaced by your cell, whereas the antisense strand has a complementary sequence to messenger RNA because that messenger RNA is made from the antisense strand. So now we're going to take a closer look at the different steps uh, to transcription and see what's happening in this process. So the first thing that has to happen in transcription is the double helix needs to be broken apart or split apart, just like in DNA replication. And so RNA prime, uh, polymerase is the molecule that does this, the enzyme that does this, and it binds to a promoter on the antisense strand, and a promoter is kind of an uh, initiator or, or a starting factor. And so po RNA polymerase uncoils the DNA, and then as it moves along the DNA, free nucleoside triphosphates bond to the complementary base pairs on the DNA. So this would be those nucleoside triphosphates, and they are matching the antisense strand of the DNA, which is in blue in this case. And in order for these new RNA nucleotides to be connected, just like in DNA, that, that, that requires some energy in order for that bond to be formed. And so those nucleoside triphosphates um, release two phosphates in order to bond those two together. And so this process continues. Um, moving in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, just like in DNA replication, and it continues until the RNA polymerase gets to a terminator region, which is essentially just a turn-off point or a, a point in the gene in the DNA that says to stop transcription. The RNA polymerase releases, the messenger RNA that has been made releases, if it's a eukaryotic cell, it's going to have those uh, introns removed, and then the double the double helix reforms, the DNA recoils. And so to break that down into some steps over the next two slides, there's some steps to explain this process that we just talked about. If you'd like, you can pause, it, uh, pause the video in order to write them down. So the next thing that we want to talk about is messenger RNA splicing. And this is a single gene that codes for multiple different proteins. And it occurs in genes with multiple exons. Proteins from spliced messenger RNAs will have different amino acid sequences. And an example of this is tryptomycin. It has 11 different exons, and they are spliced differently in different tissues. And so what this does is it forms five different types of proteins. Um, skeletal muscle is missing exon number two. Uh, smooth muscle is missing um, exon number three and ten. And so the presence or the absence of these different exons can change the different uh, different types of proteins that are formed. Gene expression 
is regulated by the presence of other proteins or chemicals or even sometimes the environment. And an example of this can be found in E. coli. And so here's an image to help illustrate this. Here we have our DNA that's eventually going to become messenger RNA and our, our polypeptide. And here is a repressor protein. And so what's happening is, in this case, we're looking at lactose, the sugar lactose. And so the genes responsible for the absorption and metabolism of lactose are expressed or turned on in the presence of lactose, and they are not expressed in the absence of lactose. So if lactose is not present, then this gene is not expressed. So if lactose is present, this gene, um, this gene expression repressor is turned off. And what that then allows is, um, here's our lactose, so this is binding to this repressor protein. And if lactose is present, it's bound to this, to this protein, and so then it's removed. And what that allows then is for this gene to actually be expressed and to make messenger RNA. And so in the presence of, of lactose, this gene expression repressor uh, is turned off, and then once the lactose is broken down, the repressor protein is activated. So this protein here would be reactivated, and then it stops the expression of lactose metabolism genes. So it's the presence or absence of lactose right here, represented by this little blue circle, that's turning the repressor protein, the purple C-looking thing here, on or off. If lactose is present, this can act as an inhibitor, and it gets released from the DNA, and so transcription is able to occur. In the absence of lactose, there's nothing inhibiting it, so it's able to stay on that DNA and block the transcription of that messenger RNA gene. A eukaryotic example of this, um, or, or some further explanation for eukaryotics, in eukaryotes there can be enhancers and silencers. And an enhancer does pretty much what it says or sounds like. It increases the rate of transcription, whereas a silencer decreases the rate of transcription. Um, they may not be directly uh, located to the gene. They might be further up the gene sequence. Um, and a promoter is essentially a, a, a number of nucleotides um, that helps to initiate transcription. Um, and so proteins are binding to it. It's a promoter region, so it's a section of the DNA, and a protein binds to it that then initiates or starts the process of transcription. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the environment can impact the expression of genes. Um, for example, skin pigmentation can be uh, influenced by the environment. Um, an uneven distribution of morphogens, chemicals, can affect uh, the patterns of gene expression as cells are differentiating, embryonic cells are differentiating. And a really good example of this can be found in Siamese cats. Uh, they have some very distinctive coloration um, in comparison to other cats. And the reason for this is a gene that codes for the production of tyrosinase, uh, which is the first pigment protein that's produced, uh, a mutant allele or form of that gene allows for normal pigmentation production at temperatures below body temperature. If the temperature is increased, the protein product is inactive and, or less active, which then results in less pigmentation, which results in this lighter color. And so really what this is dependent on is the, the temperature uh, helping to influence the gene and determine if it's on or off, it's if it's active or inactive. Another really good example of the environmental impacts is also in temperature, and this is with turtle eggs. Uh, depending on the temperature at which the eggs are incubated, it can change the sex of those turtles. And so as global temperatures have been changing uh, over the last few centuries, this could pose an environmental problem for turtles as the temperature increases or decreases, it's going to affect what type of sex those turtles will become. And this, this topic is called epigenetics. It's the study of heritable changes not caused due to DNA changes or mutations. And this is a really new, interesting field in biology um, and one that's, that has a lot of unanswered questions and a, rel a lot of really interesting questions that, that hopefully will be answered uh, in the coming decades with new research. And so in our next video, we'll, we'll begin discussing translation and the, the second part of actually making proteins.